Good morning, Gate to Church. How are you doing? I just wanted to say that I thoroughly enjoyed Pastor Jonathan's message last week on the promise of salvation. Uh, it was rather impactful, and uh, I love it when uh, words like that are given, because uh, I appreciate the Word of God. Also, thank you to those that spoke to me before the service this morning. I could feel the anticipation or expectation in your voices about what you wanted God to do in the service today. And I just pray that the Lord meets every one of your expectations to the fullest. Uh, we're going to look at uh, several scriptures today. And I'm talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to look at several texts found in the Bible. And... Uh, so we encourage you to follow the screen closely or look it up on your iPhone or your Bibles or whatever you use. But we're talking about the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. He is God. I've had people to get up and walk out of the service when I said, I believe that the Holy Spirit is God. Can you believe that? So, but, but there tends to be uh, not as much teaching concerning him, but it's very important that we understand his role. The first scripture we can look at this morning is found in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. And the word of God says, Behold, I send the promise of my father unto you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now Jesus gave this word to his disciples and told them he wanted them to go into the city of Jerusalem and to prepare to receive the promise of the Father. Well, we could ask ourselves a question, well, what is the promise of the Father? And we'll find that out in just a few moments. But the promise here is to be endued with power from on high. The word endued means to be clothed with. It's like if I had a, a, an extra garment up on stage with me and I put a jacket or a coat on, I would be clothing or enduing myself with a garment. And so it's like the putting on of a garment. We feel him coming upon us, enduing us, subduing us, and we submit to him and he presents a power in your life, in my life, that we may not have experienced before. Let me ask you this. Have you received power since the Holy Spirit has come into your life? For many of us, that's since the day of salvation. Did you receive power on the day you got saved? You need to ask yourself that question. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says, But you shall receive power, dunamis, which means like our, our derivative in English for dynamite. Have you received a dynamite kind of power, an excitement, a passion, a thrill about God? You see... The, the, the things of God are not dull and boring. They're exciting. They should fill us with passion and a desire, a hunger, a thirst for more of the things of God. How, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you again. Almost identical words. But receiving power. What for? 
And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So it's a power to witness. A power to give your testimony. You're not afraid of people because of this power. How many of you find it easy to witness and testify to others about the experience that God has done in your life? Or you seldom do it. Or you never have done it since you've been saved. All right, here again, you're in a dilemma. You have received power to do this. Why are you not doing it? Where is the power? We've got to ask ourselves some questions. If we're not flowing in the power of God, then I could be missing something or something has not been added to my life yet that should be added. Boy, the Word of God is amazing, isn't it? In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says here, And being assembled together with them, this is Jesus now speaking, He commanded them, notice these strong words, not advised, but commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is how urgent Christ was to his disciples that they assembled themselves and stay in Jerusalem until a certain event took place in their life. That they not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, here it is again, for the promise of the Father. Wow. Which he said, you have heard from me, John truly baptized with water. Notice two baptisms here. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. It's amazing what the Bible will reveal to us if we'll take time to read it. Not just fast to get through it, but we take time to read it and let it speak to us. It shows us detail by detail, step by step, verse by verse, what God has intended for our lives. The baptism of John was a baptism of repentance, a baptism unto salvation, but then Jesus said here, you shall receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, Jesus is speaking again, and he says here, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. You see, Christ himself had received the promise of the Holy Spirit. On the day of his baptism, when he came up out of the water, you remember John the Baptist baptized him in the river Jordan. The heavens were open. They heard a voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit of God, what? It descended upon Him in the the form of a dove, lighted upon His shoulder, and the Scripture says it did not depart. Now that was the difference between Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. The Spirit would come, He would clothe them, He would endue them with power in the Old Testament, but then after their mission was done or accomplished, the Spirit of God would depart. But on King David, it says, the Spirit of God came upon him and stayed. It did not depart. So the Spirit of God in the Old Testament didn't come upon everybody and stay and remain. It did come upon some. David is proof of it. But in the New Testament, 
the Spirit of God, when God gives you His Spirit, He doesn't give the Spirit to take the Spirit of way. The Spirit comes to stay. The Spirit comes to abide, to dwell, to remain in your life and my life. The Bible calls him a paraclete. It's a Greek word which means a go-between. He is one that comes between us uh, like he comes and he stays beside us. So wherever we go, he goes. He'll never leave us nor forsake us because he's called to be our divine helper, our assistant. Thank God for that. Can somebody say amen? All right. Receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this, which you now see and hear. So the Holy Spirit can be poured out. You know, in old time revivals in Baptist church, Methodist churches, sing songs all the time, you know. Holy Spirit, pour out on us. Holy Spirit, come down. All of these things. People are hungry for a presence of God. Hungry to feel God. Want God. We want to know that God considers us, that we matter to Him. Well, He loves us. He said, Jesus said, I and the Father will come and we will dwell inside of you. Our bodies become the temples of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God dwelt in a building, in a tabernacle. In the New Testament, He dwells in us. We are now the temple of God. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why we should not defile this temple or allow anything else to defile it. We, we have holy vessels. And God wants us to be a holy people. And He comes where there's holy people. He comes where we are, are moving in faith and expectation. And we want a move of God. Amen? Hallelujah. It also says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, For the promise is to you. Turn to your neighbor and say, The promise is to you. Amen? <laughs> Justin, the promise is to you. But that's not all. This ought to make every mother and father excited. And to your children. We need to see our children filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, I tell you, I've seen it so many times. It's an exciting thing to see children. The Spirit of God come upon them. They weep. They cry. You know, God gives them a language to pray in that's not English. They use that language. It's, it's an amazing thing. Their lives are transformed. God wants to touch us as young in life as He can. Why, in God's name, do we make it hard and wait till we're 20 or 40 or 60 or 80 or 100 years of age or never before we let God come into our lives and be a part of our lives. He wants to come in when we're young. Fill us when we're young. Possess us when we're young. That's why moms and dads, get filled with the Spirit of God on behalf of your family and your children so that you can be an, a vessel to impart the Spirit of God to them. And to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Four things there. The promise is to you. The promise is to your children. The promise is to all who are far off. Those who are backslidden. Those who are far away from God. Those that don't know God. Those that have never been saved. And it's to those who've been called of God. And every born again person has been called of God. We all have some uh, reason or purpose that God has put us on this earth. There's something that God wants you to do with your life. 
But you have to surrender your life. You have to submit your life. You have to ask God to take your life and do with it as he wants, as he desires, and as he wills. Okay. Now let's look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and 39. We've been dealing with the promise of God. Now we're going to look at the gift of God. The promise of God is that we would be endued with power from on high. The promise is to me, it's to my family, it's to my children. It's because I've been called of God. It's to give me, to give me power to witness. Power to be the Christian that God wants me to be. Power to resist temptation. You see, though, you know, it, it's a contradiction. And it's an oxymoron to be a born-again man and to be an alcoholic. To be a born-again person and to be a homosexual. To be a born-again person and to have a tendency to want to backslide. It's a contradiction. Why? God gives us power that we may resist the torments of the devil and of the enemy and all things like that. He gives us power to be overcomers. He gives us power to be victorious. Amen? How many of you know you're victorious in the name of Jesus? Yes, you are. You're more than conquerors through him. It says here in verse 28, Then Peter said to them, Repent. This was on the day of Pentecost. They asked him what was going on. How was it that all of the disciples and 120 people in the upper room, they heard them speaking with languages, 15 different known languages were acknowledged that very day. And he, they said, what's going on? Are y'all drunk? And he said, no, we're not drunk. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. Too early for that. But this is what the prophet Joel Joel has prophesied concerning the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And they were all convicted. They were pricked in their hearts, the scripture says. They were the 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 word pricked in the in the Greek there means they were cut. Like taking a knife. They were cut. Something very physical, noticeable. See, when the Spirit of God is dealing with you, you'll know it. When God speaks to you, you'll know it. When God is impelling or giving you an impulse to do something or asking you to do something that will require obedience on your part, you'll know it. And in that moment, you have a choice. You have a choice to obey or disobey. And the voice of God can be speaking to you, and you can flip it away and walk right away from it. It's your choice. But you'll know it. That you'll have an inward instinct, an inward feeling, an inward something that is speaking to you or urging you to go do something. We, we have to learn how to hear the voice of God. And then obey the voice of God. So repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. All right? That's all about salvation. That's about being born again. But there's more to it. And you shall receive the gift. What in the world is that? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So what is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, let's turn to Acts chapter 8 and verse 14 and we'll find out. What this gift is. Acts 8, 14. <clears throat> now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem 
heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Now, this is what any pastor, any preacher will desire. is when you're preaching, you want people to receive the word of God and not reject it. That is, that is our longing and our heart's desire. It's to see on your faces you're receiving something from God. And it can be seen. You can see faith on someone. You can see someone receiving something that brings them joy or delight or, or, or brings a, a question to their heart. It's like a, a light bulb is going on in the minds of people. They sent Peter and John to them, who when they came down, prayed for these people at Samaria, for that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting, these words? They're in revival. You would think they already have the Holy Spirit, but not so. For as yet, he had fallen upon none of them. Notice the, the Holy Spirit falls upon people. He comes upon people. He endues or clothes. We just discussed that. Clothes himself with people. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Meaning they had only been saved. Whoa, that will work with your theology. That will work with your denominational background. I'm going to stick with the Bible. I don't know about you. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them. How does the gift of the Holy Spirit come? By the laying on of hands. And according to Hebrews chapter 6, that's one of the basic doctrines of the church is the laying on of hands. With the laying on of hands, there comes an impartation from God. And they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon, who was a sorcerer, demonic, demon, in the revival service, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Saying, this is Simon, give me this power also. He saw it as a musician, I mean a magician's power, a skill or a trick. That's what he saw it as. I'll give you money if you'll give me that power. I want to be able to do what you guys are doing. Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you. Pretty strong words. Because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Simon saw the Spirit of God come upon people. They began to speak with a, another language. Great joy fell on all the people that were there in Samaria. And Simon wanted this power himself. But he was going about it the wrong way. That's not how the gift of God is received. How I many you know that everything in the kingdom of God, we receive it by faith? Amen? Everything we receive from God, you had to receive your salvation by faith. You had to get up and decide to come to church this morning by faith. <laughs> you had to decide if you're going to worship God or not this morning or sit there with your hands folded by faith or the absence by faith. You had to decide if you were going to take your precious money, write out a check or get cash out of your billfold and put it in the offering plate by faith. You have to decide right now if you're going to listen to the message 
of God by faith. You're going to have to decide in a few minutes if you're going to come to the altar and ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit yourself by faith or the absence of faith. You won't come. It's by faith. There are those that tell us that, that in churches like this, we are a, a non-intellectual service. We are an unintellectual people uh, because we talk about such gibberish and such nonsense. Too bad these particular individuals have taken their scriptures and have torn out their pages in their Bibles. Because guess what? It's in their books too. It's just that when they read it, guess what? They refuse to receive the word of God by faith. When they read it, they take their faith Throw it out the window. It's a shame. Look in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. We find now the Spirit of God through ministry, Peter's ministry comes to the Gentiles. We just read in Acts in Samaria it fell on Jews. Now it's falling on Gentiles. Well, unless you, if you're not a Jew, then you're a Gentile. So all, most of us here this morning are Gentiles. There might be a few Jews that were born Jewish. But Jews are Gentiles. And it says, while Peter was speaking these words, while he was preaching. That's amazing to me. While he was just preaching the word of God, the spirit fell on all those who heard the words. That's another longing of a pastor is while we're preaching in the very process of preaching. See the spirit of God fall on people and do things. That's an exciting sight to see as well. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now there are those that are offended with the word tongue, but the word tongue actually means language. So they heard them speak in languages. According to scripture, in Acts chapter 2, they were known languages. So they were known tongues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and about the first four, uh, four or five verses, the Apostle Paul writes and speaks of an unknown language. And so... There are known languages, and then there is an unknown language that God's people can speak in. The unknown language is more like a personal devotional language that you speak in an unknown tongue. And he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but he edifies himself. When there's prophecy in the church, it needs to be unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. What's wrong with that? Don't you know that it, sometimes in your life you need to be edified? Sometimes in your life you need to be exhorted? Sometimes in your life you need to be comforted? What can be bad about that? What about Paul when he said, and I thank God that I pray in tongues more than you all. That there, there's not a more intellectual man in Scripture. 
except the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus chose a scholar to write all of the New Testament doctrines that you and I cherish and honor and hold dearly. So we're not, you know, checking our brains at the door. Nobody took my brain from me when I came this morning like I had to check my hat or coat with somebody before I came into the service. I brought my mind, my intelligence with me. I know exactly what I am doing right now. I'm doing it on purpose. I'm doing it for a reason. And I'm doing it with my understanding. And I'm also doing it by faith. You know, I had somebody follow me one time. We're talking about how the Holy Spirit comes. I've laid hands on people before, and they've, they've broken out in a sweat. It's like putting your hand on somebody, and they're like, have, they have a fever. And they just start sweating. And the room is like now, very comfortable. I'm not sweating, are you sweating? Some of you might be cold. But you lay hands on people, the Holy Spirit comes and it's like heat. Heat many times is related to healing. God heals many people when the Spirit of God comes upon them. What's wrong with that if you're not feeling well? He becomes your divine protector, your guard. He comes and sets a guardian, a divine guardianship around his chosen people. People have fallen in the Spirit. People have gotten drunk. Uh, I've laid hands on some of the hardest people to receive the Holy Spirit that I've prayed for throughout time has been those that are highly intellectual. Sometimes intellectual smarties, too smart for their own britches. They analyze and scrutinize and divide and check and split and tear apart every little thing. They have difficulty in receiving the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's it's not by Anything you do, it's by God's Spirit. It's not by not might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. So he bypasses your understanding at the moment, and it's your Spirit that he fills and dwells, and it's your Spirit that begins to speak. I visited a lady in the hospital one time. She was... In her 40s, late 40s at the time, she had had a stroke. Too young to have a stroke. But nevertheless, she was in the hospital. And I went, Mary Joel and I went to visit her, and we're talking with her. And uh, she literally, she couldn't even say a sentence like, see, spot, run. You know, that's what we teach our kids. She could not make a sentence. And for, for some reason, I said, can you speak in the Spirit? And she opened her mouth, and there was a fluid, nonstop language. Boom. Just came flowing out of her mouth. My mouth sort of dropped wide open because I, that was sort of a new for me at the moment. And it was like that God was showing me a lesson right there. One is her mind. Her ability, her intellect, and I'm bypassing that, and I'm speaking through her spirit. And so that's why the Apostle Paul said, also in Corinthians, I pray with my understanding, and I pray with my spirit. I sing with my understanding, and I sing. With my spirit. Two different things. You can sing with your understanding. You can sing with your mind. Or you can sing in the spirit. With the language that God gives you. Now when I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. 50 years ago. Next year. I was in New Haven, Connecticut. My wife and I were visiting a Northern Baptist church 
on Sunday night, and the pastor had in a Pentecostal preacher to teach his people about the Holy Ghost in a Baptist church. So I didn't know anything about it. We were having marriage problems, and and uh, I was studying opera. I was going to be an opera singer and all that. That's why we were in New Haven. I would travel into New York City, take voice lessons, and come and sing in opera companies and hold down three or four jobs, and she had three or four jobs. You know, we were young. It didn't matter. We were excited. You know, at it. But then somebody came up and spent the weekend with us, told us about the Holy Spirit, argued with the woman the whole weekend. She had scripture. I had none. So when she left, I said, I, we need to check this out. I pulled out my Bible, started looking through the book of Acts, and lo and behold, everything she'd said, it was true. So I, I was just like, man, why didn't somebody tell me about this before that? That gummit. I knew I needed something. So we, we, we asked, I don't know what we did. I started praying or something, but God, the hand of God supernaturally started leading us. Led us to this Baptist church. Learned about the Holy Spirit. One night, Mary Jo was sick. She couldn't go. It was just as well that she didn't. She, she was not open to it at that time anyway. So I go by myself. So the pastor gets up, preaches on the Holy Spirit. I was hungry, ready to get it, full of faith, anticipation. Came down to the altar. The guys laid handles on me. I felt like somebody took a, a, a thermos of liquid butter, warm butter, and just poured it from the top of my head. And it just, I did not speak in tongues, but I felt like I was baptized with love all the way down to the soles of my feet. I went home and the very first thing out of her mouth was, what happened to you? i I don't know. <laughs> when I was in the bed that night, I was laying flat on my back. My hands were like this the other way. God, I don't know what happened, but I accuse you. So I went back to my pastor and I said, look, I can sing in Italian. I can sing in German. I can sing in French. And I have sung in Latin. So I'm having trouble here with the tongue. Is it me, or is it what I've learned? And he talked with me for a little while, and he said, you're going to have to believe God and take an act of faith. Everybody say faith. You're going to have to move in faith, brothers and sisters. There's no other way to get the gift of God but by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. How would you get saved? You got convicted and came to the altar and prayed a sinner's prayer, right? By faith, whether you felt anything or cried a bucket of tears, it was still by faith. And that's the way it is now. So I said, okay, I went back home, went into the throne room, bathroom, sat down on the, the throne, said, God, I, I'm singing this, 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 and this. But by faith, I believe you, and here goes. And I've been speaking in another language for 50 years. My wife, the night she went, she's Southern Baptist, raised Southern Baptist. I was too. I have the Holy Spirit. I had the Holy Spirit. I didn't push her. I left her alone. Didn't try to jam it down her throat. The night they preached again, we went to the altar. The guy picked her out. She almost started to say, but I'm Southern. They laid hands on her head. It was like an artesian well. I mean, I just stood. I was envious. I was jealous. I was almost like mad. <laughs> How come I had such trouble? And she received it so easily. Just like that. It's real. My mother got sick with cancer. 
And I talked to her many, many times about receiving the Holy Spirit. And she said, oh, buddy, I have the Holy Spirit. And she was Southern Baptist, you know. And she got sick. And at that time, I was leading worship and praise in Assembly God Church. And the senior pastor went out to see my mother one day. <clears throat> and she was in a wheelchair, no hair, had a bonnet for on her head. And uh, I get a telephone call. I was at the church, telephone call. He says, you need to come home right away. Scared the daylights out of me. I, I had no idea what had happened. I thought she, she might have died or something. But I got in the car, came home as fast as I could. He was no longer there. The pastor had left. And she was outside on the deck. She was in her wheelchair. And I'll never forget it. Walked up on the thing. She said, she said, oh, buddy, she said, I don't know what happened. But she lifted her hands. I've never seen her do that before. But she lifted her hands and she started praying in this beautiful language. And the, the Spirit of God came on her at 6 o'clock in the morning about a day or so later and stayed on her for over 24 hours. And every time you'd go into her house, she'd be laying in that special bed they had to get for her. And her hands would be in the air and she'd be speaking in another language. And I'd been praying and fasting and asking God to heal her of the cancer. And uh, God did this for me instead. He filled her with the Holy Spirit. He healed her spirit. And uh, I'll always be thankful to God for that. Let me just say a few words about faith. Got to close this thing. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, it's the most amazing chapter in the, in the Bible, really, in the New Testament. You're just reading along, and scholars tell us that we don't know who the Arthur, Arthur of Hebrews was, but I speculate that it was Paul. It's so Pauline in its text, in its form. And many other pastors agree with me about it. Or I agree with them. And he introduces us in the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 10 about faith and the need that we have of having confidence and let not our confidence slip. And we need to be bold and have confidence. And then he talks out, now faith is a substance of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. And he talks about how that by faith we understand that the worlds were made. You see, you got to understand that it's by faith we understand that how the worlds were created. Or else you're going to believe in evolution. Pure and simple. Because there's not a living person on the earth, even the major evolutionists can explain what happened because nobody was there when it was all created. We accept it by the hand and the pen of our creator that he created the heavens and the earth. By faith, Abraham, when he heard a word from God, the Bible says just very simply, he obeyed. And in his obeying, he went out not knowing where he was going. How do you explain that one? Did God ever ask you to go somewhere that you didn't know where you were going? It takes faith. Can you believe this one? Mo uh, Noah, go build a boat. Hadn't rained yet. Haven't even misted yet. Nobody had seen rain. Nobody had seen mist. And he, he wasn't near water. He wasn't even near the ocean. 
Go build a ship. Go build a boat. Egos build the boat. out. It's like building a boat out back here on dry land. Well, that's going to go over real big, isn't it? But again, it says 18 different times by faith, Abraham, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abel, by faith, Moses, by faith, Sarah, all of these people, by faith, heard God speak something and rose up and obeyed. You're going to have to do the same. In closing, take the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, Father, hallowed be thy name, name, thy kingdom. So, Father, name, kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth, as it is, or just as it is in heaven. That is is a apostolic prayer because it was, it was prayed by Jesus. It says in Hebrews 3 and 1, consider Jesus the apostle. It was an apostolic prayer about the will of God. He wants His will done on the earth as it is in heaven, in the Roman culture, which they more than likely got it from the Greek culture, when the Romans would go and conquer a territory or they would conquer a city, if they had to travel by boat and they would send out the Roman fleet and they would go across the water and they would conquer a new land or conquer a new city for Caesar. The head boat, the first ship in the fleet was called the Apostle Boat, the Apostolos. The leader, the general, was in that boat. The, the head Roman, he was also called an Apostle. And it was his duty to go into that region that they were conquering or to that, that city that they had conquered for Caesar. And with him on that boat, he had architects. He had philosophers. He had dr drama people, actors. He had all kinds of people, governmental officials, all on that boat. They would go into that, re that region for this purpose was to do the will of Caesar. In other words, they were to bring Rome to that town. They were to bring Rome to that region. That the will be done on earth <laughs> as it is in heaven. And so the philosophers would begin to teach the people that were conquered. The government officials would begin to declare Roman government what it was like to the conquered. They would begin to build Roman architect to those that had been conquered. And they would completely transform that region or that city into a Roman area. If so, it were that Caesar happened to want to visit there, get this, that it would not be a strange land to him, but he would be comfortable in a Roman district, in a Roman area. Now let's look at the Lord's Prayer again. That thy will be done on earth as it already is, as it is in heaven. That's what God is wanting to do today here at the church. 
He's wanting to transform us. I heard uh, Miles Monroe say one time that the Holy Spirit has a language. There's a language of heaven. And God wants to give it to His people and instruct His people with this language. Would you stand with us?